Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. After all that time that you've had off, you remembered where we are. We just got back from two, week, two uh, weeks in Salt Lake City. Some of you know, some of you don't. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that Wednesday night. Uh, but we're more convinced than ever of, uh, of our need in our move to Q to uh, be generous in the outreaching and sharing of, of what God has done with us. Um, we've already made some connections. We had dinner with a, a local pastor on, uh, I think it was... Tuesday of last week, and uh, he made a comment which there are some benefits to being 61, because uh, he made the comment, he, he said, here's the thing, he said, I perceive that you are 30 years on in your journey from where we are, and we'd like to draw on that. So, uh, yeah, so it's good to be back, and it's good to be there, and it's good that we're in a process of change, and we will take it as it comes. It's a little strange for me, I must admit, in the context that we have actually been meeting in some kind of format like this for almost 20 years now, believe it or not. We, sometime after my tenure here as senior pastor, we began to launch something we call Rock City, which was aimed at reaching the Micklegate crowd at that time and was very stage-based, rock-based, a lot of the elements that we have now and a little wilder. And uh, that might not sound like much, but 20 years ago, nobody was doing that. Now when you look around, you see everybody's doing that, but then nobody was doing that. The issue is that everybody only does something when somebody has the courage to do it when nobody's doing it. And that's our spirit, that's part of who we are as a house, that's part of our our change and our accommodation. Believe it or not, it's, um, it's 11 years since we went exclusively to Saturday night. So these are strange feelings for me. It's a, it's a change of direction. It's a change of life in many ways. But God is with us. So let's just pray. Father, thank you that you are with us. You promise you'll never leave us or forsake us. We've never had to f- try and find where you were at because you've always been in the same place right next to us. Sometimes we've felt it, sometimes we haven't felt it, but whenever we've not felt it, you have never moved, you've still been there, you've always been present, and we thank you tonight that we rest in that love and that kindness and that generosity and that favor in Jesus' name. Amen. The only bit that I don't know if the favor of God was falling out the back of a removal truck in Salt Lake City and, and kissing a desk on the way down. Uh, So I don't know if there's a devil or not a devil, but that sure didn't feel very good. But we're recovering. All right, I want to talk to you uh, just for a few minutes, just just really because uh, tonight is a funeral service. Uh, We will not be the rock again after tonight. And uh, I want to express my grateful goodbyes uh, for what has been an interesting journey and a precious journey in in many, many ways, an important journey in, in, uh, in my own life. So I, uh, I wanted to call what I, what I talk about today, the grave you, ex- the grave you accept. Um, perhaps this day is best defined by this typing error that uh, I made in this familiar statement that I have used before, and I made this error a few months ago, not recognizing it until I read it in my notes as I was talking to you Uh, up here, because the familiar phrase was that you will not be measured by the good that you do, but by the grace you accept. But this few months ago, I don't know, some of you will remember it, I had made this typing error, and this typing error said that you will not be measured by the good that you do, but by the grave you accept. Um, I actually think that was a God thing. I think that sometimes we need reminding that there are some things that have to die, that death is part of life. That for any resurrection, there has to be a death. For any springtime, there has to be an autumn and a winter. 
For any renewal, there has to be a passing away. And sometimes we become reluctant to engage this process of death within the context of life when actually death is a part of life that in nature is a consistent process that is going on. We tend to want to ignore the process of death until that one last moment when we or someone that we love uh, reach that point. And incidentally, we send our grace out to Joyce who lost a brother and another family member over Christmas to Chris Brown, whose mom died. Um, but we so often miss that, that death is an important part of life. And if, if we don't embrace death, then we never, get, we never get springtime and harvest. We never get change. We are locked almost into a Narnia experience of forever winter, never Christmas, because we get locked into something that will not embrace the process that some things have to die. There are things in our life that have to die. There are, there are things in our experience that have to die. And if we don't let them die, if we keep them alive, then unfortunately they become like rotting flesh that decays and eats into us. We have to know what's the time for something to die and to bury it. And that is a process of life. And some of you need to learn that. That's why we get old and miserable because we don't learn the things in the process of life that need to die. And we need to step out into some new areas of life. So I made this statement, you will not be measured by the good that you do, but by the grave you accept. I wonder if you're willing to accept a grave tonight. I wonder what your feelings are about the change. The truth is we live in an ever-changing world. How many of you know that? That is changing now quicker than you could have ever imagined. And it requires us to continually embrace a process of adaptation if we're to remain relevant to our calling. We cannot do things now like we used to do them. We have to have new ideas. It's harder for me at 61 now than it was when I took over this house at 35 and began to change things because I, I just have the same difficulties embracing the process of change and I think I'm pretty hip. <laughs> but some things still are beyond my understanding and comprehension and that's where some of you have got to help us to flow together. I know we can bring some wisdom and some understanding but sometimes that freshness, that freshness of youth that does not recognize the consequences of decisions is necessary. The older you get, the more you become aware of the consequence of your decisions, then you overthink and you do nothing. When you're a little younger, you don't embrace the consequences till they've happened. And actually, that might be a problem, but it's also a blessing because it, it's that spirit that says, let's do this, let's go for this. So we need, we need everybody, we need you guys who are, coming through your, your teens, your 20s, your 30s to help us move this thing forward. But we have to stay relevant by embracing it and adapting the process of change. See, people are often conscious about what we owe to the past. And I understand that. Um, and we should always be respectful and, and thankful for the past because it delivered us to where we are. I'm thankful for my heritage. I'm thankful for my upbringing. I'm thankful for my parents. I'm thankful for the good and the bad that I experienced because all those things help to, to shape us. But, but there is another question which is not about our consciousness of what we owe to the past, but what do we owe to the future? You know, what do we now, as leaving the rock, owe to the future? It's not what we owe to the past because the rock was this or the rock was that. What do we owe to the future? How do we embrace that debt that says we owe something to the future? We owe something to where things need to be in 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years' time, not to where things were 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. We owe something to the future. And wisdom will embrace that. Now, I, I always knew this partially, but I, I, did some, I did some investigation and research and, and found, this to be, found this to be true. Back in 1924, on the 1st of February, there was a gentleman by the name of Arthur Watkinson who led a group of believers here in York. And he attended a meeting down in Birmingham that was organized by a guy that, um, that, that some of you will be aware of. His name was John Nelson Parr. 
And this meeting in Birmingham in 1924, 1st of February, was really an inauguration meeting to begin to decide some form and some structure to what would become from that meeting in 1924, the Assemblies of God Churches of Great Britain. And uh, this guy who was down there, Arthur Watkinson, was at that very first meeting in 1924. And in 1924 into 1925, this, this great movement of Assemblies of God, uh, which, which I understand the name, but have never liked the name in a modern context, but I'll explain that to you in a moment. This, this great movement of, of believers who had had an experience with God in a different way, an experience of the Holy Spirit, and who were finding that they needed to cut a path where a path was not cut, began to come together, and so they formed a movement of churches known as the Assemblies of God of Great Britain, of which we were part until just a few years ago. For I'm happy to share that story with anybody who wishes to ask, but that's how I grew up, and that's what I was a part of. Now, what is interesting is we still had that name until I took over the leadership of this house in 1991 when I was 35, and we were still the Assemblies of God Church because we hadn't even become the Rock Church then when I first took over the, the leadership. My point is this, that this house in one form or another has existed in this city for almost 100 years. We're not just talking about the 11 years that we've met on a Saturday, or even the, even the 20 plus little years of us becoming the rock from the Assemblies of God. We are talking about a journey that has been going on for almost 100 years that has evolved into this. We have a heritage. We owe something to that past because it brought us to today, but we are making changes because of what we owe to the future and how we need to serve the future, not the past. And so, so uh, just a few years after I took on the leadership, in fact, a couple of years after I took on the leadership, um, Assemblies of God meant something when it was created because these assemblies of people who loved God and were being suppressed and repressed because of their testimony of something new, when they gathered together, called themselves Assemblies of God's people. Therefore, the name was Assemblies of God. It had great relevance in 1924 and through the growth of that movement, probably into the 70s or 80s. But then as time changed and as culture changed, the name became unrecognizable in its original form because now it wasn't describing something that was. It was describing a heritage from the past that meant something then but not now. That was part of my reason and my desire to change the name of the church in, in, in about 93, 203. And change it to what I felt at the time was a more relevant, connecting name, which described our style, which was rock. It described our basis of faith, which was Christ the rock, and the revelation that came with that. And so we changed from what we were to accommodate the name for who we had become and who we were becoming, and that has been our name for 20-some years. <clears throat> so today marks another step, not just in 11 years of the history of this church, but almost 100 years. Now, there is very sound precedent in Scripture, for any of you that know Scripture, have taken the time to read Scripture or paid attention to any of the Scripture that has been shared with you, to do with name changes. And they are not uncommon in Scripture. You can find, just picking out a few, you find that Abraham became Abraham, his wife Sarah I became Sarah, Jacob became Israel, uh, Saul became Paul, there's another one as well. Joseph, funnily enough, who was in Egypt, became Zafnaf PNA, which is not a name you'd want to be changed to. <laughs> so, despite the temptation to call this Zafpaf Zafnaf PNA Church, I, re I resisted that temptation. But if you understand the context, Joseph had now moved to Egypt. He had a different place, a different statement, a different role in the culture, and his name changed because of that so that he could be effective in Egyptian culture 
as a Jew transferred, a Hebrew transferred, Joseph was a Hebrew name, he was given an Egyptian name, and in that Egyptian name, he was able to influence Egyptian society because that change of the name denoted something. Uh, Peter, the disciple, was known as Simon, and Jesus changed his name to Peter, the rock. And then the most classic of all that many people miss, Jesus had a name change. He started as the Word in heaven, and he was born of a virgin. He said, you'll give him the name Jesus. But then, when he was anointed at the River Jordan, when he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came on him, he became the Christ. So Christ is not Jesus' surname. Christ is the name that Jesus was given that connected to his anointing that related then to his earthly ministry rather than just being part of a, a Jewish family. So this process of name change is, is, is a critical thing in Scripture for a reason, which is that, that those name changes carried with them the reality of a recognition that the one whose name was about to be changed had come through a process of transition and was no longer who they used to be. The new name given always described who they had now become and were becoming. So those changes, Jacob, his name meant supplanter or cheat, and his name was changed to Israel, prince with God, because now he was becoming something that he had not previously been. So I am, I am confident, as this is the second time that I have done this in, in my ministry, with the need to change the name because we are not who we were. And the name describes who we have become and who we are becoming. We are a people on a quest. We're on a quest for something beyond where we have ever been. And of course, as you see the advertising for Q, you'll see those quests for spirituality and, and for joy and for, for relationship and, and, spirit, and, and for, uh, for justice and all of those things you'll see uh, coming up as we go along and that's for next week. So... This name change thing denoted a recognition of the process in the person's life, reaching a particular point where new beginnings is the only reasonable mark of progress. I, I believe from my own life that I have reached a point in life where new beginnings is the only reasonable thing to do in the process, and therefore with that comes the name change. It always marked the beginning of a new era, the name would always relate to what would be the future outwork purpose in that life. So Prince with God was the future outwork purpose. Abraham, father of a multitude, was the outwork purpose. Christ, the anointed one, was the outwork purpose. Q Church, the quest, is the outwork purpose that we have been called to. And I hope you've been with us. So, why? Why, why is this necessary from a scriptural perspective? Let, let, me, let me read you a couple of verses from, from the book of Hebrews. I'm just pulling them out of the chapter. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 8. It's talking about the coming of Jesus. It's talking about the changes that had to be enacted in his own being for him to become human flesh. And sometimes we forget that. There were changes necessary in his own being. And his statement was, a body you have prepared for me. And of course, he, he ceases to be the word in heaven and becomes Jesus in the flesh. Change, name change, denoting who he was becoming and who he had become. And so in that chapter, it says this, previously saying, sacrifice and offering... Burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Now, the reason I wanted to bring that verse in is this. All these things were the common practice of the developed belief system that had come to Israel from their relationship with God. But it says, sacrifice and offering, burnt offering, offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure with them. Or in other words, you have to have the courage and the understanding to know what is just stuff. Because often God reaches a point where he is not that pleased with our stuff. Because our stuff is missing the point. Let me tell you what their stuff was to them. It was a mood-altering process 
equal to taking drugs, equal to drinking alcohol, equal to being addicted to sex or pornography, all the things that give you a buzz, this was the equal to. Now, some of you can't get your head around that, but a lot of church practice has become a mood-altering process. So you use drugs to change your mood. We use different things and systems here. They use different sacrifices and offerings and temple processes that change the mood of the follower to feel that somehow now they were connected with God when actually all that had happened was their mood had been changed because of a series of activities and processes and demands. So here you've got it, black and white in Scripture. And then he goes on to say in verse 9, and then he said... This is Jesus, behold, I have come to do your will. I hope that the overriding desire, commitment, want of not only myself, but you as part of this house is that we have come to do your will, O God. That something inside of us says we might be caught up in stuff, but we have come to do your will, O God. And listen to this statement. He says, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. There is a principle in Scripture of taking away to establish. Now, here's what we don't like. We like the established, but we don't like the taking away. We don't like to give up in order to gain. We like to just keep it all. But you see, for Jesus to experience what resurrection would bring meant he had to have life taken away in the form that he was now experiencing it, in order that he could experience the new life of resurrection. We want to keep both, but you see, the principle of Scripture is he takes away that he may establish. There has to be a taking away of who we have been in order to establish who we have become and who we are becoming. So this is a funeral for the rock on those terms. There's another amazing Scripture, and I'll finish with this, in Genesis chapter 48. He talks about Joseph, the prince of Egypt, the one who had the coat of many colors, the one about whom movies have been made. <clears throat> and uh, this is the story of when Joseph is dying, he's on his deathbed. And uh, on his deathbed, all his children are gathered around him, but not only his children, but, but sorry, this is, this is not Joseph, sorry, this is Jacob is on his deathbed. Let's get the facts right. Jacob, Joseph's father, the one who's had his name changed from cheat and supplanter to Israel, prince with God, is now on his deathbed. And Joseph, the one who has also had his name changed in Egypt and now lives in Egypt, who's brought his father to that place of safety, is now at his father's bedside as his father Jacob is dying. And as Jacob is dying, Joseph brings his two sons, which are Jacob's grandsons, to the deathbed of Jacob. And uh, he asks his father for a blessing on these two sons. Now, these two sons simply represent who we have birthed and what we have birthed in the process of our journey. And uh, we have particular thoughts about that and what's precious to us and what we think is more important. and, uh, And so did Joseph. And so he brings Ephraim and Manasseh, his two sons born in Egypt, to his dying father's bedside to get a blessing on the sons. And um, the whole issue was in, in, in Hebrew culture and pretty much scattered across all that Eastern culture was that the right hand always gave the greatest blessing. You gave the greater blessing with the right hand, you gave the lesser blessing with the left hand. So if you read any of ancient, script, any ancient text and scripture as ancient text, you will read things like that the, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Because it was a common understanding, it was a colloquialism that meant that that is the place of greater blessing. Okay. So Joseph brings Manasseh the oldest and Ephraim the youngest and he positions Manasseh by Jacob's right hand and he positions Ephraim by his left hand. And he moves them forward and says, Father, bless my children. And and as as Jacob goes to bless the children, right hand on the firstborn Manasseh, left hand on the secondborn Ephraim, he does something very strange because as he's about to pray for them, he does this, he crosses his hands. 
And in doing that, he, in that process, gives the greater blessing to Ephraim, the lesser, and the lesser blessing to Manasseh, who was the firstborn and the greatest. And Joseph hit the roof. The pawpaw hit the fan because this was not how things were done. And Joseph had a sense of process that he felt should be enacted through his father's hands. But he recognized that his father was not going to be held by the process. But what his father did is did something that was not expected. Now here's my point. God rarely does the expected. If you sit and figure out what you expect to be the process, I can almost guarantee you will be wrong. And if you pursue that process, you will not find the right-hand blessing. You will only ever live in the left-hand blessing. It's not that you won't be blessed, but you live in the lesser blessing. You live in the lesser, lesser grace. You live in the lesser, lesser favor than the right-hand blessing. So I have understood in my life, and I've watched this happen many times, that the ways of God are rarely what you expect. And I think in that move from rock to queue, one of these things have happened. I had not sat a year ago planning this, thinking about this, preparing for this. In fact, I would have liked the right hand of blessing to be on what we had birthed and what we had brought. But God does not work the way that we expect. But if we cooperate with that process, you find that you come from a lesser blessing to a greater blessing. From a lesser grace to a greater grace. From a lesser favor to a greater favor. And I believe that we are in a time where we're going to see the greater favor, the greater grace, and the greater blessing come upon us and come upon our life because I think God has crossed his hands and he's put his right hand upon Q, and so we are going to go with Q. Now, what's interesting was that Joseph's sons both became part of the inheritance. Even though they were grandchildren, they were treated like sons. They were brought in. And so this is not a second-class thing. It's a first-class thing, and we're going to embrace it, and we're going to come into it. Okay, so one more thing from that chapter. I preached this at my father-in-law's funeral, who I loved dearly. He was my father in the Lord as well as my father-in-law. And he brought me into ministry and made room for me to, to be part of the, the ministry and the staff of this church in 1984. And uh, then in 1991, uh, he handed over the reins of leadership to me. He passed away in 1992 uh, before he could witness some of the changes that we were enacting as The Rock. Um, but he was precious to me and precious in my life. Uh, and, and at his funeral, I preached these verses. Because this is that same chapter where, where Jacob, and he's now being called Israel, okay, his, his new name. There's the new name, there's the blessing and the new name. It says in verse 21, Then Israel said to Joseph, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. And to you, as one who is over your brothers... I give the ridge of land that I took from the Amorites with my sword and bow. <clears throat> Point is this, it wasn't much of an inheritance, was it? Just a ridge of land that he had been able to take hold of and possess with his own sword and bow. It wasn't a country, it wasn't a nation, it wasn't a city. It was a ridge, just a ridge, just a high place that his faith had enabled him to take but by grace, what he was saying is, what I have, I am giving to you. I'm giving you the legacy of my endeavors, the legacy of my blessing, the legacy of my favor, so that that legacy becomes your legacy, so that from that ridge of land, you can branch out and take more ground. And we have done that from that day. We have branched out. We have taken more ground. We have worked from that ridge that was handed to me, that was taken with the sword and the bow by my father-in-law, and now we have a greater inheritance. My desire is to continue that legacy. My desire is at some point that that legacy passes on and that it won't just be a ridge that we took from the Amorites, but it will be something that is touching the world, reaching the world, continuing to release the blessing and the favor of God that we can pass on because our duty is no longer to the past. Our duty is to the future. So, uh, huge thanks and appreciation for all of you that have walked this journey with us. I hope you'll be here next week as well. 
because I'm bright enough to know this gives some people an out if you want it. Uh, I'm hoping that you won't want it because I am grateful that we could not have got to where we are without you. This is not a solo effort. This is a great effort. And, uh, you know, when I look out, see some of you have been with us for months and years, and then I look out for some of you who've been with us for decades and more than half a lifetime. You know, see people like Keith, who is here before me, I'm guessing, Keith. Here before me. So I'm, I'm 50... I'm 50 some years into this, 54, 55 years into this, Jim and Mavis Miller, Barbara Bradley there, John came many, many decades ago, and, uh, and some of you guys that have just, you know, you've been with us, and you've stood with us, and you've walked it through, and you've been very kind in my craziness, and uh, we've loved and walked together, and I thank you, I'm appreciative, I'm also appreciative of those who've come in recent years, for you, and for James, and all you guys who you know, just part of this legacy and part of this house. Those of you who've grown up in the house, like Charmaine, you know, who, who are a third generation from Eunice and, 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 and um, Phil and Cheryl and, and, and Charmaine, you know, the, these are all legacies that are wonderful. And together, we, I'm hoping we can carry this through and build more and move forward. So, so thanks and appreciation to all of you. Um, I, it is genuinely, sincerely, uh, means a lot to me. Uh, also, let me say this, that the challenges ahead will re require faith and sacrifice. Uh, we probably will need about another 200,000 a year to do all that we need to do. There you go. <laughs> the challenges will require faith and sacrifice. But here's the point, that can't be taken. It can only be given. I can't take faith and sacrifice from you. That can only be given by you. But I believe as we all give faith and we all give sacrifice that together we'll reach the goals that we have been set. We'll conquer the, the mountains, the, the valleys, the oceans that we're supposed to conquer. And they're just like the great explorers. No one ever discovered new lands without ever losing sight of the shore. And we've got to keep that spirit and move in that spirit so I hope that you'll give faith and sacrifice along with us that we can get there because it can only be given. So I guess my cry to you today is let's do this. Let's do this. I wonder what it was like the first day that Abraham became Abraham. First day that, 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 that Jacob became Israel. The first day that Simon became Peter. The first day that Saul became Paul, the first day that Joseph became Zafnaf PNA, <laughs> the first day that Jesus became Christ. Because for all of them, it wasn't just a change of name, it was a recognition of a direction, a journey, being engaged and, being, and, and, and the measure that God's hand was on it, and God's hand was on it for good. So we're coming to a new day, and... Uh, it's the same challenge represented in a new way for a new generation. But I do hope and pray with all my heart that we'll do this and that we'll do it together. And we'll do it in the spirit of faith. And that we'll do it because we want to create the stories that we will tell in 10 years' time. So the question is, what stories do you want to be telling your children and your grandchildren in 10 years' time? Because those stories are made now. And then in 10 years' time, we tell them because we made them now. And I know the spirit of the pioneer is back in us. I know that this move to Q is global and not, not just local. I know that it puts great strain and great stress on our, on our resources and on who we are. It will demand change of all of us. But in the context that having met this guy last week who says, you guys are 30 years on from where we are and we need help. Let's use that. Let's give that. Let's offer that. Let's sacrifice that. Let's sow that. And let today be the day where we say we'll not be measured by the good that we do, but we'll be measured by the grave we accept. The rock will not be measured by the good that it has done, but by the grave that it accepts, because that shows that we believe in resurrection. When we believe in resurrection, we believe in the Christ. And when we believe in the Christ, 
Heaven comes, the kingdom comes, his will is done, his work is done here on earth just like it is in heaven. So, as we would say at the funeral, we lay the body of the dear departed in the grave to the ashes, the dust from whence it emerged and came. But I always say this at funerals, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection of the dead. So what we bury today, we move in confidence of a sure and certain hope of a resurrection of all that needs to come forth into new life, and that God will be with us and we will be a blessing to our world in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Good. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.